So while many people think that climate change is something out there in the future, for us, it's a daily reality of what we live with. If we were here seven years ago and looked up this hill, we'd see a fir tree about every 12 feet. And with the very hot summers in 2016 and 17, about 90% of the trees in this area died. This die off is part of a pattern that's happening in a bathtub ring all around the Willamette Valley, where trees that were in areas that had relatively poor soils got to about the age 25, 30 years old and didn't have what it took to uh, make it through these hot summers. So this is my great-great-grandfather, Oren Ingram. He had started as a person running sawmills in the Adirondacks and then moved to the upper Midwest in the upper Mississippi. My family's involvement with forests and wood has moved both across time and across space, starting with my great-great-grandfather in upstate New York and through another chapter with my grandfather in the upper Lake States and then ending here in the Pacific Northwest. Our family has owned and been owned by the three forests that make up Hilo Woods since 1986, and it gives us a chance to conduct an experiment that explores what's required in order to have forests that are simultaneously ecologically complex and economically viable. The main ways we're seeing the changing climate is reflected in our trees, and that we're having trees that have lived perfectly well for many years die. And some of those are 30-year-old fir trees, some of them are 150-year-old western red cedar trees. And also it's harder to get young trees to grow. It's just a more stressful, harsh climate for them to live in. Right here is a stand that's about two acres where we thinned it and then the whole rest of the stand died. There are two large pockets um, that have died off. And the biggest one right here, there's a 60-acre basin. And in many of those areas, up to 90% of the Douglas fir trees that the previous owner planted died at age 30. So we're ending up uh, clearing that out and then turning it back into a mixed age, mixed species forest. In this area, which we call the wildwood, is where we're experiencing large scale die off of old, large Western red cedar trees. In addition to taking care of and restoring the oak we have, we're creating new oak habitat. And that includes an 11 acre pasture that we're turning back into an oak forest and those trees are struggling, and one of the steps we're taking is to go out and water them in this really hot summer to just help get them through that first year. So one of the valuable outputs from this forest and all forests is cold, clean water. And we're lucky to have a series of springs that then feed creeks. And what we're seeing is some of those creeks that have run for hundreds of years are now drying up in the driest part of the year. And that's a problem and something we've got to adapt to. I would say for probably 10 years, we've been seeing signs that to us look like they're tied to changing climate. And one of the challenges is you never know for certain what is caused by climate and what is not. With each passing year, it has become clearer. A lot of our work has shifted to restoring areas where we've had trees die off and basically whole areas of forest become non-forest and figure out how to take those and help take them back toward being an appropriate forest ecological community. And that requires a lot of work. For good reason, there's a lot of encouragement to practice climate smart forestry. And at the same time, we believe that climate is not our only challenge, that we've got unraveling biodiversity and we need to figure out how do we balance all of these together. So climate is part of what we do, but it's not the only thing that we focus on. So our choice is to call it climate smarter forestry. And there are two big aspects. One is what do we do in the forest, but also we can't do it alone, that the architects and the builders and all those need to be committed to working toward those same goals because we can only get there by working together. And working in the forest, again, it breaks into two clumps. One is the mitigation side. How do we have a forest that catches and holds as much carbon as it can reasonably hold while also being a functional forest. And the other side of it is adaptation. How do we grow a forest that will have the resilience and adaptive capacity to deal with the stresses it's already facing and the increasing stresses that we know will be coming down the road. 
we need to lead by example around how we actually operate. So our goal is to become completely independent from fossil fuel. And we've taken steps in that direction and we can now see a pathway that will take us before very long to being independent of fossil fuels. And examples of that would include, for instance, our solar dry kiln that runs on sun energy, that our trucks and the logging equipment could be running on renewable diesel, and we're working on having that happen, and things like chainsaws and vehicles to get around the forest. It's realistic now to have those be running on electricity. That's a transition that we are working on, and we're excited to work with others to make happen. So it's this balance of how do we treat the forest, how do we operate in the forest, and how do we work within a larger community to create an environment that incentivizes a, a larger picture of climate smarter forestry. So we need to imagine and create an approach to forestry that works as well or better in the long run than it does in the short run. And to do that, we need to be very thoughtful about what are we actually doing? How are we interacting with the forest? And the term that's most useful to us is this idea of regenerative forestry. And by that, we mean creating conditions so that every place in the forest, if you walked away from it and came back in five years, 10 years, 50 years, it would become healthier, more functional, more resilient over time. When people ask me, what does a recently logged area look like? I'd like to bring them to this spot because the logging equipment moved out just a few weeks ago. When you look up the hill, you can see what I would see is moving toward our goals. So you've got two species of conifer trees, dug fir and grand fir, and you've got two hardwoods, you've got alder and you've got maple, and we're beginning to see multiple ages, multiple species. And I would say if you walked away from this for 50 years and came back, it would only become better. So we're achieving that regenerative goal in this site. So this kind of restoration would be impossible without the partners we're lucky to have. And one example is the Tualatin Soil and Water Conservation District that brings lots of expertise and money that's important. And also the hardworking crews like Rosario Franco's crew that have helped deal with invasives, planted trees, protected trees. So it's a teamwork project in a community forest. And our approach is one that works with the processes of nature, which means that we only will use herbicide if we feel we have no other alternative. Our work with the forests is inspired by ideas that we think have been part of Oregon for as long as there's been an Oregon. And one of those was voiced by a logger I ran into who said, you know, I think we just need to figure out how to take care of what we've got. And also how do we restore the things we've got? So those ideas I think are important and things that I think all Oregonians would share and relate to. As we've worked to take care of our forest, we've recognized that we and other forest owners are faced with a dilemma where the world tells us either your forest is gonna be healthy and ecologically complex or it's gonna be economically viable. And we feel that's a bad choice. So our purpose, our reason for being, is to imagine and create new approaches to forestry that tell ourselves and the world that you don't have to choose between those two, but you must insist on both. On the ground, it means that the choices we make cause us to always put the forest first and say what actions will maintain and improve the health of this forest. And we have to blend those with the realities of saying in this current economy and the economy we need to create, how do we provide enough revenue that this can be a functional business that will support us and the larger community.